We have a couple of goals here this morning. One is to discuss the land acknowledgement. And the land acknowledgement, as I printed up here, most of this comes from the Dwell tribe and an understanding of land acknowledgement. And that we're acknowledging people that existed uh, in this area uh, long before Europeans came to this area. Um, acknowledging that they have stewarded this land. Um, and it also comes with a response um, as to how we how we react to that, how we proclaim that. So ultimately, here in a few slides, we'll get to the uh, land acknowledgement that was created for us to, to look at and to approve. Hopefully, council has uh, recommended it um, and to the congregational meeting for, for next week. And the second part of this is to look at boarding schools. Uh, the, the orange banner on the session front um, is what displays that. We'll, we'll go into a little history of, of how that came about and why the call for us to be participating with that orange banner. And that's relative to boarding schools. So that'll be kind of the second half of what we're going to be dealing with. I'm going to start first with some, uh, some language. Um, and I'm going to have a, a, a few Allen tribal member help us pronounce, pronouncing these words, but basically Shalops is the Swiftwater people. And Tuatake is the name of the, what the native people call Cape Harbor. And so I'm gonna quick just have him in a couple of minutes share how those should be pronounced. Which means swift water people. This name refers to the swift waters of the mirrors. There's a raised W in this word, which is made in the back of the throat with the lips rounded. <laughs> The suffix obj means people. Now let's try the whole word all together. Swabobj. Swabobj. Hoyopchas. Hoyopchas. We are finished. Sorry, can you replay that again? Yes. <laughs> I've listened to it so many times. Ah, slachel twogulapu. Today, we're going to go over the word for the group of Puyallups who lived in Gig Harbor in our ancestral language, Twil Shotzid. Uh, the name of our ancestors that lived in Gig Harbor were called the Swabobj, which means swift water people. This name refers to the swift waters of the Narrows. There is an X wedged raised W in this word, which is made in the back of the throat with the lips rounded. The suffix obj means people. Now let's try the whole word all together. Swabobj. Swabobj. Hoyopchas. Hoyopchas. We are finished. And, and now that you've perfected that, <laughs> we're going to go on to the next word <laughs> of what the native people call a harbor. Uh, today, we're going to go over the Twilshotseed word for Gig Harbor in the ancestral language of the Puyallup people, Spoyalapaj. Uh, the word for Gig Harbor in Twilshotseed is Twalkas, Twalkas, which means place where game exists. There is an X raised W in the word, uh, which is a rounding of the lips and then blowing. There are two A's in this word, which elongates the sound. Ah, ah. There is a Q in this word, which is made by placing your tongue on the bottom of your mouth and then pushing the sound to the back of your throat. Puh, puh. There is a barred L 
in this word, which is made by placing the tip of your tongue on the ridge behind your teeth on the top of your mouth, then blowing air around it. Uh, so now let's try the word all together. Tall cut. Tall cut. Hoi chat. Hoi chat. We are finished. You ever wondered? Those terms are going to come up uh, quite a bit here in the next little bit. So there we start the words that we just have discussed. And now a little bit of history of uh, European travel in here. It was actually considered that the first landing of Europeans were the Spanish on the coastal shores, near ocean shores, about 1775. Um, and, and that's what's noted when you start reading. I've left four books back here that I've read um, about history. And, and I'm, I, I have a feeling that some of them is not right because they're often kind of disagreeing with each other too. Um, and I'll show you a reason why I think it might have happened before 1775 in a minute. But Captain James Cook came in then with uh, on his ship into the Strait in, the, in 1778. He didn't go any further than the Strait, actually, the, the far western region of the Strait. But apparently, the, some of the native peoples did come and trade with him. So there's kind of a sense of already awareness of, of uh, non-indigenous people and some kind of trade, which shows too, because apparently the ship landed in Grace Harbor before it arrived um, here at the, the, the Straits. And um, the, the natives there already spoke this trading language called the Chinook jargon. Um, and that'll come up quite a bit too. So it wasn't those should see or any other that language of the Coast Salish people was a different language, just to promote trade. So the people already in Grace Harbor were familiar with that trade and it kind of originated in the North in Canada. So somehow they've already been communicating even down into the, the shores, uh, further down into Washington area um, prior to this time. So then, and also this time, both the Russians and the Spanish were trying to stake claims. So the Spanish coming up from California uh, area to state claims. And that's why it was so important for historically that in 1775 that they actually put landed here, but then they tried to set up a, in order to prove ownership, you had to set up a community somewhere. And so that's what they did. They set up a place um, and actually different uh, missionaries came into this place and didn't last very long. But just to, to, to show that there is uh, semblance of them being there in that community and doing something with it. So you have the Russians from the north and Spanish coming up from the south and the English wanting to claim somewhere in the, in the middle. So you had English traders that would come into the area in the 1780s. And so finally, the ship Discovery with Captain George Vancouver came into the greater Puget Sound area. Um, and they uh, came down I'll show you a map really quick. Kind of hard to see. I'll show you. They started up here, which is Bainbridge Island, is right about here, and Blake Island. So the ship itself stopped, it didn't come any further. And then they broke into smaller groups. And we're going to talk mostly about the group then that came down into there to watch it. Um, we're going to talk about that group going south. But another group with uh, Vancouver itself came over into Commencement Bay and probably they say came down as far as in, uh, just uh, Sport Silicon area. Um, but we're going to, for our sake, because it's our area and our land acknowledgement that we're working on, stay to uh, Peter Puget, of which Puget's sound was named after. He was the one that was put in charge with Joseph Whitby. So you start to read names, and these are English. You start to read names, and you see how they're associated with 
places around in our in our area. So Peter Puget and uh, Joseph Whitby came with their exploring group on an 18 foot cutter, single mass, and they had the oar to, to make their way. Um, first place that they actually stopped was Lalala, which is the place of many berries. Mm -hmm. They actually found some native people there, and but there was very little interaction, um, according to the journals of people. And then in their pro progressing downward, they missed the entry to Big Harbor initially, mm -hmm. um, or at least they haven't noted that. They definitely didn't come in at that time. Again, this is the 17th, about 1792 May. Um, and so they made their way around. Show you the map again. So here, Alala was up here, and they've made their around around uh, Point Fosnick now. And so they've come up into the Lodge a little ways. So that's where they are. Um, they stopped for a bit at Point Fosnick, and the story goes that there were uh, a number of natives on the shoreline, uh, but only one older native woman stayed. Um, and everybody else ran into the woods and they, they landed and actually did a little bit of trading with her and that encouraged others to come down and to communicate so let's just speak and, and sharing of things um, there at the Point Plaza area. Um, so then they continued on after that visit. Um, well, actually, I'm going to go back a little bit. We'll watch it. Cutthroat, just the, the definite name. And the tradition has it, it's, it was based on um, a young native man who <laughs> slit his throat uh, because he didn't get the woman in marriage that he wanted. To. <laughs> so, and it's also referred to by some as the sporting clans. So, <laughs> Petro is a technical, uh, technical division of that word. Um, but at that time, they encountered um, natives with pierced noses and ears. What's interesting is that copper ornaments and beads, you say, mm, copper, you know, how did, how did copper come about? Kind of to me, again, another indication that trade already kind of existed. Um, because you'll find out later, one of the things they wanted to trade was for copper. So they were already somewhat familiar with it. So that's one way that it seems that there was probably at least traders that had been in the area prior to this time, even though this is considered kind of the first entry into the Puget Sound area. Um, then they got uh, they further traveled up into the Burley Lagoon, where their folks are there and more stout natives pitted with smallpox. Well, how did they get smallpox? Um, so another show that likelihood is there was already some trading that was taking place. In fact, another notation I read in an article was that they figured about 11,000 native people had died, 30% uh, of uh, the, what was considered in the uh, this whole region, uh, not just the sound, but all throughout the Coast Salish people, um, had already between 1769 and 1780 um, had died of smallpox. So here they are, they knew what the, the English knew what smallpox looked like, and they had on Burley um, Lagoon some people approaching them uh, that were pitted with smallpox. And they had, and then they went to Bitter Village and they had their kind of their first aggressive encounter uh, because they decided they were going to set nets down and catch fish in the winter. They were been there, I live pretty close to there. You do see the salmon. We've been the salmon on the creek by our house a few years back. So a lot of salmon came into that area. There was a village there. Um, and the likelihood is that they were the Pasquale from the Pasquale tribe rather than the Puyallup tribe. And I have read. Um, I read a report by a young woman from Tacoma Community College saying that Chief Leshai himself, his father, <laughs> came from uh, this village at uh, Minter Creek. And I said, well, where did she get that from? So I found out in another book, one of those I had there, who refers to it, but, but no recollection as to you know, stating how they know that. Because when you read the Sepali history, they say that the father came from the, the plains area above the Nisqually River because he had horses. And uh, Leshai's mother was from the Kamayaka over on the other side of the pass, uh, which is also, when they describe Chief Leshai, is considered taller than most Nisqually people. They think it's partly because um, they were tended to be a little taller and uh, the, the 
Kamiakum uh, people uh, over in Yakima. So partly why he might have gotten that that night. Um, but anyway, here they are, Minter Village. They go to cast their nets. There's a very aggressive response by the native people because their understanding is they didn't understand that they owned that place, but they had the rights for the fish or whatever came out of there. And so here you're infringing upon, and in their customs, if another group came and tried to do that, they would show an aggressive sign towards them. Uh, it sounds like later they were able to, to finally do some trading, even with those people. Um, Mitch of the Shuttlebosh uh, were the ones of the early lagoon, and then also at uh, uh, oh, uh, Glen Cove, which is just a little bit further to the, to the west from there. In our map, so here they made their way from uh, what caused it into the watch it came by, then land on Rap Island, but kept going along, had their encounter in the Burley Lagoon, that made it to um, where the um, the Mitchell Wood, Mitchell Creek area is, um, and moved on through the sound from there. So there wasn't a whole lot of activity after that known historically that's written and described until a later period. The Hudson Bay Company out of, of the, the English Hudson Bay Company, they were the ones that began and headquartered at Fort Nisqually. So a little bit further on the south and the east side in 1833 is when they established that fort. Um, again, some names, because here we have a naval exploration, the Wilkes Expedition of 1841, Osbeck, uh, Orson Carr. So you see again, a lot of people that were on those, those groups, expeditions, um, were able to get their names on certain locations and places. So May 15th, though, they came and uh, the quote from uh, the person coming into the bay for the first time, Big Harbor area. Um, a pretty little bay, saw no natives. Um, and Lieutenant George Sinclair, who was also on, said, Well, I'm going to take a look as well and see what, what there is. So he approached it in the captain's gig, where the English name Gig Harbor comes from, um, and hence the, the name. And he called it an excellent little bay. And at that point, when he arrived that couple days later, there were a number of canoes and they were trading sand. So again, trade was existent, they, they were aware of it. Um, and again, there were still a lot of salmon in the clock at Bay. Um, and again, just noting that they were there, they lived, they were cooking. That was a place where they resided. Um, they likely at that time didn't venture any further in to see what now has become Crescent Creek, Donkey Creek. So it was by what is now known as Donkey Creek, was where they had their longhouse and um, several other outbuildings as well. So other history related to it, the English basically gave to the United States in 1846 Oregon Territory, which included what's now known as Washington, Oregon, Wyoming, Idaho, um, all of that, that block of area. So here we're dealing 1846. I was just looking at my uh, bookshelf the other day. I have an 1844 dated book um, that's in German. Uh, that was my great grandfather's. Um, the time period is not that long. That's here. We're just starting. Uh, this, this is when our territory was become part of the United States. It was in a time frame that just a couple generations previous. So prior to this, in those times, 1850, they had a donation land act. So if you came and you set yourself on a piece of property and stayed there for four years, you could get that 160 acres of land per, uh, 320 acres of land per person, and a married couple could then settle on 640, no costs associated with that. This again was land that was uh, acquired by the United States of, uh, of English. And uh, Pierce County itself was created, named after President Franklin Pierce at the time. Um, and it was still established, it was still an Oregon territory. So that name came about from the legislature of Oregon. Washington Territory, but then established in 1853, which stayed that way until 1889 when it became a state. Um, so it's still pretty, pretty late in time, it wasn't that long ago, but this has happened. 
Isaac Stevens was the first appointed governor, and kind of oddity was he was also then the territorial superintendent of Indian Affairs. That combination put him kind of in control of pretty much everything that was going on in this in this area, which became the, the Washington Territory. Um, he was a pretty dynamic individual, um, um, to say the least, from the histories that you read. If you want to look at those books again, or um, you get a lot of history, especially of the, the bitter waters that Medicine Creek goes into the whole Medicine Creek tree. Um, and they spent a lot of time exploring both Chief Leshy and Isaac Stevens. So here we have this Medicine Creek tree because Isaac Stevens was tasked, partly on his own behalf, um, to make more land available for an expanding the United States people, so for English people to move in. So he was going to establish these trees throughout this whole Northwest region of Salish peoples. Um, and he was actually not here at the time he had gave his powers to somebody else, I forget his name right at the moment. And that person decided, let's start the first tree with the Medicine Creek area, which is the, the Squally Basin, is where Medicine Creek is, also known as uh, McAllister, because there was no an English uh, person who had established as part of offshoot of the uh, Hudson Bay Company that had a farmland in there. So it's that same general reason. So here we have 1854, the Medicine Creek Tree on Christmas, is the day before Christmas, where they basically um, told the native people of the area, so South Sound, um, and at that time they just referred to that they were either the Squally, Puyallup, or the Squaxin tribes that were represented there. That's all that they were considering. Um, and they decided to call it a potlatch. Uh, so, which is kind of a gift giving ceremony for native peoples. And they were going to spring this treaty on them um, at that time. The treaty was actually written by a gentleman named George Gibbs, who, um, real wealthy East Coast family. He went to law school and then wanted an adventure. So, he came out to Oregon on the Oregon Trail. And ultimately, then was an ethnographer and also one who uh, writes treaties. So he started some of them like in, in Oregon to begin with. So he's the one who wrote the, the treaty itself. And that had that people give him a lot of credit for knowing a lot, seemingly, of, about the people of the area, at least knowing where they, they lived. And maybe you could say the customs, but not really describe why the importance of those customs were. So he just had an awareness rather than a really knowledge of, of that. So at Christmas time, they were basically told um, the original ideas of the mess Creek Treaty was everybody was going to move to the small Fox and Island. Um, and, and that was everybody from that, that southern sound. Area. And it was actually George Gibbs that says, well, that's not going to work. Not because, just because you're trying to mix a conglomeration of different peoples into one space. Not less to say that there was really very little place for them. There was no place, it's all trees. So then the Squally people wouldn't have places to put their horses. They were known for having horses. Um, they, they, they didn't have uh, land to be able to grow things, so they couldn't be farmers there either. So they decided, okay, well, we'll give three little spots. We'll give a spot, still Squawks and Island. We'll give a little spot near the Squally River, and then one here at Commencement Bay for the, for the well. Well, Chief Lesh, I realized, you know, because he, he traveled a lot. He was on, he had worked partly for a company that was an offshoot of the Hudson Bay Company. So he traveled, he knew he had horses, had his own horses. He knew what land was out there. He knew where people were. Again, at this time, there were more native people in the area than there were white people, white settlers that had moved in. So he knew there was, this, this was, there was a problem with this. And he, he objected to the point where Though there is an X of his name on the, the treaty, um, he and many others, um, he wasn't the one who made that X. Um, so they left. There were actually about 50 natives that left after the first day. And um, the others ultimately did sign um, this treaty. And again, it was written in the Chinook jargon. Um, so it wasn't written in their own language. It was describing areas that ultimately ended up not even the areas that they were supposedly to be receiving. Um, that took place after the treaty to say, okay, well, this is what we really meant, and trying to find um, locations for them. 
but this was the treaty of the land. Um, Isaac Stevens got it back to Congress and they approved it within a couple of months. So this was the treaty of this area, the Medicine Creek Treaty. Um, so unless you went back to Congress to get it changed, it wasn't going to get changed. So there was what became as a, a, a war, uh, an Indian War of 1855 and 1856. And where it, it probably ended up being maybe 150 to 200 Native warriors that participated in it. It came started with um, what's known as Auburn now as slaughter uh, at the time, because that was the a lieutenant and the, a volunteer uh, army at that point. Uh, I would call the army, but a volunteer sort of groups. Um, Somebody got shot, and they, they blamed ultimately Chief Leshite for being the one that, that was the one that shot him. And I'll get back to that a little bit. His brother, Quibut, was the other one that kind of were chosen as kind of chiefs to guide people at that time because they kind of spoke out. They were the sports first people for the time. Um, after this skirmishes of that 1855-1856 area, Quibut gave himself up and was immediately murdered in the, uh, the mansion of the governor um, in the middle of the night. And Chief Leshai was eventually uh, turned in by his nephew, so they found him um, and did go on trial and was convicted of murder after the second first trial. It was a hung jury. And the second trial of uh, he was convicted of murder. And again, lots of details in the books that go into the reasons and why, but unless I was actually exonerated in 2004, and you say, well, how does, how does that happen? It wasn't an official uh, kind of, it was a, they did have seven justices that got together to hear arguments. The state really didn't present any arguments other than the fact that it's too long. You can't change something that's already through our established legal system. Um, and the facts are, given what was presented at the trial, that he murdered, even though the facts didn't present that. And that's what uh, the, uh, the defense group said. Uh, there's several people that said he wasn't even there at the time of this murder to begin with, which is ultimately how they exonerated him. Um, because of the fact that this was a war, they called it war, as Stevens called it a war, where you don't have, you can't have an individual trial for somebody for murder in, in war. It would come under a whole different act. So, in other words, they're saying this is false. You can't, you can't hold him uh, as a murderer within civil law um, if it's war. Um, but that wasn't ultimately the reason why they exonerated him. They exonerated him. Um, no, actually, they did because it was considered not it was considered a war. So, therefore, he couldn't have been held in, uh, in civil a civil court for that charge. So what about our area? Well, okay. Close. Place where game exists. Um, it, it's unknown how sheltered this area was at the time of the Medicine Creek Treaty, because everybody else, especially when the Indian War was established and began, they all got moved to Fox Island. Everybody did. They wanted all of the natives who weren't going to um, be a, a nuisance to them to move there so that they could attend to the, the warriors, the few people that were out there that were uh, to them causing problems. So you can hear of even people on Bashaw Island uh, commenting on being interned on Fox Island, but I haven't read anywhere yet where the group from the harbor, the harbor area, um, were ever uh, could, didn't ever have to leave their area. But it, it's it's a little unclear. Um, in the Homestead Act of 1862, people then could come in and buy land. Dollar twenty-five an acre. However, this was considered prime military land. Same with Point Defiance here it was established numbers of years before. So the actual government kept control of this and had military reservations. So there was limited areas where settlers could even move into at that time. So you had the first arrival into the, the area of settlers, uh, Samuel Jerichus, John, and they pronounced his name multiple different ways, even in legal documents, Farragut and Peter Goldsmith. Um, Jerzic um, was actually, his wife was First Nations, which is the term that Canadians use for their indigenous people. Um, she was a First Nations um, out of Canada, because that's where he had actually moved to from 
Croatia area at the time, uh, initially. And then we came down and found the harbor. We said, ah, I'm going to want to move back here. And that's where he went back up to Canada and brought his wife and his first daughter down into the area. Um, again, establishing presence. Uh, 1879, during the first census, census uh, that census, uh, we still had a gig harbor band, 46 men, women, and children. And when you read some of uh, Marion Smith, who was an uh, anthropologist, came into the area and published a book in 1940 talking about the people of the Puget Sound region. Um, she said that tribal people in their groups, since they tended to be based on water tributaries, that they tended to be no more than about 50, 50 people just to have their families and their communities of the size that they would keep them at. So this would not be untypical of uh, a full uh, tribal presence here in the, in the harbor area. And still, even in the 1900 census, there were only 126 whites living in our area. So still, you had a preponderance of Native peoples uh, still living here as of the uh, year 1900. Um, and just reading some more things that have occurred even in our area, uh, the village of Donkey Creek hoped to maintain its tradition of hosting community gatherings and potlatches. This was into the fact of 1915 where the Long Act still existed. Um, but again, very recent history that the 100 foot Long House still was established on the land down here. It's called Donkey Creek. I don't know if you, so what's Donkey Creek have to do with anything? It was originally Burnham Creek um, to initial settlers because John Burnham was, uh, he was the first person to actually plot out land for a town in Big Harbor. And he owned land up above what we now call Donkey Creek. And so at the time, it was Burnham Creek. And then when it came time to getting official names on the books, Donkey was refers to a steam engine, a steam engine that would pull logs down into the waterways and get them down to mills. So that's how it got its name Donkey Creek. And it just so happens then that that area, Austin, Charles Austin, Osgood Austin, so the Austin estuary of the region, because he was the one that had the sawmill uh, there from 1909 to 1946, and they kept it. He just leased the land. He didn't own the land at that time. So John and Josephine Novak <laughs> were the ones that uh, had the land at that time, and uh, they basically would say that their name was probably Novakich. Um, the, the, the son of Novak, Novak, which is kind of how names transpired. But again, to Americanize and feel like you belonged, you often changed your names. And that's true of Scandinavian people as well. Everybody's in the orders with that, or of ease, of ease of communicating names um, would um, Americanize their names. Um, other things that they do note of or the David Squall, it was actually out of a watch it. Uh, you'll often see pictures of going to the Big Harbor Museum of Anne Squally, long hair, uh, did a lot of braiding and, and artwork. Uh, and, but it was David Squally, who they had a ceremony for his death in 1922, and I would remember in this area. Um, and the last pretty much known, at least from what's been described in the history that I've read, um, ceremony in the, in the area. Um, but we do know uh, Fashion Island has an incredible museum too, that there were three people that did depositions in 1927 um, that were a part, had been at the Medicine Creek Treaty. And basically they were saying we were defrauded and they gave reasons why, even though they were probably very young, they were probably eight, eight years old in that, that area and had been there, but so had Isaac Stevens' son at Hazard was also there, and he was pretty young at the time. So, Schwabach, Saltwater people. Um, and, and again, these names are going to show up in our land acknowledgement in a little bit. And you heard of the, the, the pronouncing words earlier, the Shuiolos, that's what the Tuala people's name is uh, uh, pronounced as in the Lushuchi language. Um, and the, the uh, Schwabops 
figure there are three main areas Bash Island, the quarter, quartermaster harbor um, here in the harbor that developed Walmart and, and it uh, will watch it. And then they figure they actually probably moved from the um, Halmos Creek, which is kind of the north end of Commencement Bay. Um, and so as they spread out, um, this is where they, they came to. Um, and again, we talked a little bit about but the area is really truly vastly true. So they even have in the native uh, stories, you don't go into the trees if you're you have done something that's been negative in your community because you're gonna have these little elf kind of beings that are gonna trip you up. <laughs> but it was partly to say you're gonna get lost back there. So be careful when you go back into this heavily treated areas. So here's an acknowledgement of uh, those grants, Marilyn Collier, Sharon E. Belt, Sharon Crump, Ronnie Coolman, and I worked on um, that uh, we presented to the council the other night. Um, and it was approved and we're gonna take a look at at the congregational meeting um, next week. So we, the Agnes Day Lutheran Faith Community, acknowledge that we gather each week on the traditional homelands of the Kuala people a Coast Salish Lashutsi speaking people. Y'all people have lived along these shores for thousands of years, faithfully stewarding these lands and waters as they continue to do today. The earliest native residents, the branch of the Swift Water people, call this land Kwalke, and their longhouse is within walking distance of our church. This land acknowledges one step toward engagement and true solidarity with the Kuala tribe. We commit to uplifting the voices, experiences, histories, and concerns of the Kuala and of all indigenous peoples, and to being good stewards of the land and water which surrounds. You kept the word in the Chukchi language, Kuala, and, and the reason we did it, even the formation of that uh, land acknowledgement comes from the Kuala tribe. They're the ones kind of give ideas as to how to present a land acknowledgement and and they thought that it was um, it was a negative to transliterate it the way we tend to um so we decided to pre prefer to keep it up there um, the cheap cheap language um, printing so here were just some things of uh, some books that i had had read and a lot of literature on board uh, online um, something of interest maybe that uh, Ronnie has discovered through the Harbor of Wild Watch. Uh, there's a salmon tour coming up on these next two Saturdays in the morning. Uh, people could meet at the Estuary Park and kind of see the, some of the chum that are coming through. Uh, Sharon and I were just uh, driving yesterday across up ahead of uh, a little early, driving across the bridge. There was a huge eagle sitting right over there before it dumped it. Uh, so obviously there are fish <laughs> that are out there. It's kind of Sorry? Yes. Can I mention something about <clears throat> you have Austin Estuary Park? It's now been renamed Swiftwater Austin Estuary. And Swiftwater is our word for the band of uh, people who are native here. And as you know, the elementary school was named Swiftwater. Um, but in that estuary, <clears throat> it's, it's uh, you know where it is on Harbor Street? It's just like if you walk by, you can see it. <clears throat> but you can't drive by, you can't see it. But there's a path. <clears throat> there's a path along there, and there's now uh, a post with earphones where you can hear some of the native language spoken. And the city council is planning to put plaques along there to uh, more educate. Uh, people walking by of what that swift water estuary stood for for the natives. And there will be a totem pole, which has been carved by a native person, and that will be installed. I'm not sure when, but uh, sometime soon. So uh, either in the next few months, I believe. So the swift water, I like to call it the swift water estuary because I prefer that over Austin. We have the lumber mill and the beach basket store now was the lumber mill office. Uh, so that presence was there, but 
And you might want to, if you happen to be walking in the harbor, go into that estuary and uh, there's a path that goes actually down to the water. And look for the post that has the ear things uh, that you can hear the language. And in the future, there will be more uh, there. Right after Thanksgiving, we're expecting to put these plaques that uh, tell the history of the area. Actually, you can just push the button and you don't have to wear the earphones. So I'll actually speak oh, okay. the, the language directly from it. I take one issue with one of their signs referring to these people as the Suhomish people. And I'm thinking, how did they come up with that name? So I did some more. And that's what George Gibbs, when he wrote the Medicine Creek Tree, called these people. Um, and so people after that often refer to them as the Suhomish. But the people here never refer to themselves as that. So there, there's kind of an understanding, I think, from George Gibbs of the Homish, the ending is the people of the Sahom, uh, rather than the Shabbats, which is the people of the Swift Water, the Swift Water people. So there, um, the, sculpt the sculpture um, has been, uh, it's been completed now. It's actually a project that's wanted at the city and the tribe. And it's, it should be up before the well, the mayor wants it to be up uh, before he leaves office. Uh, and so it should be up soon. Although the official ceremony, which would include tribes coming in by canoe, won't happen until sometime in the spring. So the actual structure should be up uh, perhaps you know, in the next six weeks or so. Yeah, they have their annual canoe journey for all the Salish people, and that's when they could come and hopefully be part of that here. And they were kind of excited because of the redwood tree that was found that they were carving out of, so it brings other native influences into the area as well, since it was a tree that was planted here because it's not indigenous to this area. I'm just going over boarding schools a little bit and the idea of the orange banner. Um, it refers to the story of a young girl who, uh, before she was going to be taken off to um, boarding school, uh, she had her, I think it was her grandmother, had purchased her an orange shirt. She was really excited and loved that orange shirt. And as soon as she got to the, uh, to the boarding school, they took it from her along with everything else. Um, and so it's kind of carried forward for people to remember uh, boarding school survivors. Um, I'm going to read a quick little uh, poem by Joy Harjo, who is uh, um, a poet laureate of the United States and a Native American woman about boarding schools. It's called We Are Still in Mourning. The children were stolen from these beloved lands by the government. Their hair was cut, their toys and handmade clothes ripped from them. They were bathed in pesticides and now clean, given prayers in a foreign language to recite as they were lined up to sleep, sleep alone in their army issued cages. So a little bit of background, and again, um, go back really quick. We want to be doing the studying of this National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition is where I got most of this information from. And they're off and about, like they have this um, DLCA announced uh, something coming up this week, um, you know, series uh, that they'll show be at the head of this uh, coalition will be speaking. Um, so you had a Civilization Act Fund of 1819. So you had money set aside to civilize Indians. <laughs> Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs then began in 1824 and was under the Department of War. So that's kind of how our, our government would consider Native Americans at that time. Um, they should be considered under the Department of War. Um, so then there was the Removable Indian Removal Act. A lot of you remember that as a, a Trail of Tears, um, Cherokee people, um, and, and many other tribes as they were moved. That was signed in 1830 by President Andrew Jackson. And then they decided, well, still, we haven't, we haven't found out how to deal with these people. So in 1851, they had the Indian Appropriations Act, which created the idea of Indian reservations. Okay, well, we'll, we'll put them on reservations then. Um, that wasn't going very well. They still were there 
basically a lot of outflow of funds and then it wasn't effective to doing what they thought, which was from above civilized uh, native people. So they turned that all over to Christian denominations. So they basically made Christian denominations the funds that they were already using to have power over the Indian reservations themselves. Again, funded by the government. Um, and then they realized that we're still things weren't working the way we wanted to. So rather than even try to establish treaties with them anymore, but we're going to just treat them with the words of the United States and find ways to pay a finance, uh, finance for them. Um, so then in uh, 1879, you had the first off reservation boarding school. And we kind of talked about that in the spring. Uh, General Pratt um, discovered the idea. He's the one that instituted this idea of boarding schools with the idea of, quote, kill the Indian, save the man. So the intent was to, to decrease their own understanding of themselves and make them assimilate uh, at, whatever, at whatever cost. And that was up until the 1960s that children were still taken to taken boarding schools. Now, just from the Canadian standpoint, because they had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and that was from 2008 to 2015. They spent years studying all of the um, boarding schools, 139 of them in Canada, and came up with a lot of their statistics are that they figured over 100,000, this is in Canada, that went to boarding schools and over 6,000 of them died or are missing um, during that, 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 the commission of the, the, the boarding schools. Um, and they came up with this residential school settlement agreement. Now, here's where our, our orange banner comes into play. May 2021. And you say, okay, what happened between 2015 and 2021 to know that now we can discover that there are uh, un, uh, that there are grave sites here? Uh, basically, if there was all of this information that was created even in the commission, it was available, but um, organizations weren't allowed to access that information. So it wasn't until they finally got some understanding of things that were already known and using radar scanning, they found these 215 unmarked uh, graves. And that's where the impetus of, for 225 days, were asked to place a banner to, to represent the lives lost of, of boarding school uh, students. Um, and then just a month later, they found 751 remains in Saskatchewan. And the same month, 182 uh, at St. Eugene's Mission. Again, this is Canada. All right, we're just talking about Canada right now. Well, in the United States, there are 367 known schools. So when I was listening to the woman speak, who's the leader of the, the organization, the Boarding School Coalition, she says, well, you can basically think about triple what you found in Canada um, has happened here. Maybe 300,000 kids were taken to boarding schools. Maybe 18,000 died or are missing from that, that event. Um, so in 2020, uh, Deborah Holland, uh, as a, when she was a, a representative, uh, introduced a Truth and Healing Commission Interesting, and you'll find that terminology different rather than Canada was a truth and reconciliation. And the understanding is uh, truth and healing is probably more appropriate because healing really has never taken place. So how can you reconcile if healing hasn't occurred? So she introduced the act and its stuff roots fall immediately. The Committee on Education and Labor where it was sent off to, and the Senate did the same at an identical bill, and it's stalled there as well in 2020. Um, when Deborah Holland came into office, uh, she introduced an initiative, and that went to committee and was immediately fed on arrival as well. It wasn't here until probably after the impetus of more grave sites being found, discovered in Canada, um, that it's been reintroduced, it reintroduced these bills. And this is where we can, as advocates, push to help. Um, it's it's House, House Bill 5444, and there's actually 46 co-sponsors at this point. With a, a year ago, there were very few co-sponsors, and Derek Kilmer from our area has co-sponsored that House bill. And an identical bill in the Senate with 17 co-sponsors, but none of our senators have co-sponsored on that bill. 
So one thing that I know that I'm going to be doing is writing our senators and say, why did you not also co-sponsor? Because you can you can add on as all along the way to the process of this, and also encourage that to uh, to get carried forward and actually hit the floors of the House and the Senate and be approved and agreed upon. Um, it is still uh, both Democrat and Republican involved, at least in the House. Um, there are five known Republican uh, uh, representatives that have signed on and co sponsored as well. But at this point, none on uh, the Senate. Um, and then I've been talking numbers and acts and all this, and now you get into the personal aspects. So, the last couple months, I've listened to boarding school survivors talk. I've listened to their children talk. I listened to their grandchildren talk. And the pain and agony um, that you hear in their voices when they discuss what's become of their family's lives because of boarding schools. Again, what, how can we imagine all of these? Children taken, taken from the families, your belongings taken away from you, your hair cut, hair, hair was sacred to them. There were only two times you cut it in deep shame, in most places, deep shame or deep respect. And so that was a huge, that was a huge issue, whether it was intentional, I, I don't know, perhaps. But for them, it was felt as uh, very negative. Um, another one was describing a belt line, where basically um, kids, if they spoke any words in their language, they would be required to crawl on the ground while all the other native children had to take their belts out and whip them. And if they didn't whip them hard enough, they were the next ones to go through that belt. This was some of the treatments uh, that they were given, as well as known sexual abuse that took place on these reservations as well. Plus the denial completely of their language and culture, the things that you, that were a part of you, were, were just stripped away. And again, what would we think? So he comes in and takes away our Christian faith, or at least tells us, no, you can't say anything about that. If you do, sorry, you're going to be one of those grave sites found somewhere else. Or how that culture, your liturgy, so all those things that are important and part of our Christian life are taken away from us. That's what they experience. And how they responded to it very dramatically is silence. They, they won't talk about it. The grandkids now are trying to, they, they're all of a sudden starting to hear stories that we heard about these things before, you know, um, but there's just so much grief, so much pain, so much trauma built on the people in their lives over that period of time. They, they just don't talk about it, or it gets acted out abusive behaviors to themselves and others. Um, addictions is the huge one, um, and that's why they're really asking and they're promoting that. I know from both the uh, Squamish and, uh, and and Puyallup, both of those tribes are putting a lot of money into resources for uh, mental facilities to be able to help people work to a degree. On the same way, like right now, we could decide, well, well, let's get them to talk. Let's get them to talk to us about what they experience. That is so painful inside, and it brings up further injury because they have secluded it, put it all off into a shelter. And they, we need to make be very clear to establish ways for them to have the care that they need, even if they get to that point, but they're ready to, to speak about those things that happen. And you have a lot of parents that had no idea what was parenting. They were they were thrown at a boarding school or listened to one story of a man. He'd been at boarding school, he was sent there when he was five, and they were allowed to go home, you know, at seven just for a visit. And, and they get off this bus saying, well, what's what's home? What's family? And it wasn't until their mother <laughs> Had a blanket spread out on the ground, just raised her hands, <laughs> and they came and she gave big hugs. Um, but they're still sent back to the boarding schools. That was just not, not their visit. So a lot of them, and even again, you have parents then that don't know how to raise kids. They haven't had the experience. What's love? What, what's that kind of relationship? I don't, I don't know that. So then you have kids that um, become addicted as well because <laughs> they're trying to work hard. The state is taking their kids away because they don't. We don't feel like they're able to take care of the kids. Maybe they are, but why take care of the kids solely rather than maybe help them to understand uh, what a loving, compassionate family relationship would be like? 
other things that they brought up that kind of hit home to me is you have schools and graveyards in your schools. And another native man, Fred John Jr., I think he's doing it, uh, was saying, you know, there's never, I think we need, somebody asked him, what, what do we need? And he said, I think we need a ceremony, a coming home ceremony. We were never accepted. I know in Japan they did this after World War II, or they would send uh, soldiers off and to fight. When they came back, they would have a ceremony, a ceremony for them to, to praise the fact that they were part of what they were part of, but also to say, okay, that's that's over now. And now let's let's get back into a community type uh, situation or flow. Um, so he was saying there was never a ceremony. We need a ceremony as well as ceremonies for the return of. Um, that's why it's so important for us to pass uh, this initiative, is so that we can research to find out um, different denominations that fought back. They don't want to release their records. Um, others say they don't have the records. But, you know, we keep track of our funds pretty well, our money pretty well, where it goes. Why don't we have records of lives that we were in charge of and taken care of? So that's where this commission can be set about to explore these things um, and to, to maybe bring these kids home to where they really belong. And again, those mental health needs that just need to be met because of the, the trauma that they're approaching. So that kind of, it's, Kind of quick, and all of these are pretty quick. But there's so much that's a part of them that could be said about them. But for, for boarding schools, that's why we have the wonderful, beautiful uh, orange banner uh, to, to represent that for the next 225 days. If you get, uh, maybe we'll try sometime just. Uh, let you listen to people that, that talk about uh, their lives, their family lives, and, um, like this one, uh, Fred Johns. Uh, only one sibling of his six are still alive because they basically have killed themselves or done things to, to harm themselves uh, physically, just because of the end. He's just in his 60s, and they were all younger than that. Um, and they're passing, just trying to deal or not deal with uh, the trauma created from. Um, situations in boarding schools. So just listening to them, it's been very meaningful just because you start to hear from there, them telling it, it makes it personal. And again, I can lay out facts, I can lay out numbers and acts, but it really doesn't give you a deal on how to listen to people talk about their situations. Yes? Could somebody draft a, uh, like a template letter and circulate it that we could send to our senators? I think we might be more likely to do it than if we all have Try to create our own. Yeah, I think Faith Action Network, and you can see right here, there's a, a statement on boarding schools. The INIC is part of this. Faith Not Home concedes that I'm pretty sure Faith Action Network is really good at creating those uh, kinds of statements, and I'll see if they've created one already. Make it available. It, it does make it easier, and I've done that in the last couple of years where organizations are already the same with right now. We have the LNG plant situation in the, uh, the Tide Flats in Tacoma that definitely affects a few other tribal people. And they give you ways to be able to send uh, emails or write letters or participate in uh, the meetings with the, the Tacoma representatives of the mayor that are making the decision as to what kind of activities can be involved in the Tide Flats relative to fossil fuel expansion and use. So they, they come up with these and they're very well worded and you can, and they give you opportunities to change it. If you don't feel quite as comfortable about saying something, you can adjust it to a way that fits you and makes it personalized for you. So, Okay, well, thank you again. There's a map back there if it's interested that shows uh, the young Native American man who um, took upon himself to try to name all of the native tribes in pre-European uh, arrival and their true, uh, their native names. Um, and he spent years developing that. So I brought the map and the books that I just talked about are back there to sell it back. Um, you can get to that. We'll send them to the library to, to read. Thank you for coming and listening. This is Indian 
heritage, Native American heritage. Again, the names are kind of interflux depending on who you talk to. Um, again, First Nations from Canada. A lot of people don't like the word native, um, and that others actually use and accept that even within the indigenous. It's another term that's often used. Um, and basically, the best thing is when you're speaking to someone to find out what they prefer to use um, in your uh, addressing of that. The same with tribe was that they had a negative connotations to begin with. And yet, the Chihuahua, it's the Chihuahua call it for the website, it's the Chihuahua tribe. So they adopted that. Um, same with us listening to a, 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 a quote by that. Who, even though it's in the area of what's known as a Sioux, um, he won't accept being called a Sioux because that's a snake. It's a snake in the grass. They were referred to by English people as a snake in the grass. And so I'm all Dakota, I'm not a Sioux. Mm -hmm. So again, it really depends on the people that you're talking to at the time, um, what, what preference they have for naming an acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.